أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله وحده والصلاة والسلام على من لا نبي بعده أما بعد إن شاء الله تعالى this evening we will continue in our series of lessons in the seerah of our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam uh, in our last session we talked about how <coughs> the uh, kuffar of Quraysh they decided to try to plead with uh, the uncle of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam um, and we discussed uh, some of the things or some of the narrations connected with that. So now uh, we see that uh, the kuffar, they tried at first to just completely wipe out the da'wah by uh, persecuting Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And along with him, they, they, they persecuted the, uh, some of the sahaba <clears throat> so once they saw that this persecution was not uh, turning uh, people away from Al-Islam, so then they went to the Mufawadat, which are the pleading, you know, the pleading with uh, Abu Talib, hey, convince your nephew, please tell him to uh, stop harming us and harming our deities. Uh, that's what we talked about last week. And we noticed from last week that that didn't work. So now the kuffar, what did they do next? They tried to prove the, uh, the falsehood of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam by, uh, by requesting from him to produce a miracle. Produce a miracle. And... As we mentioned uh, about the people of Thamud in our khutbah last Friday, that the kuffar, they, in these previous nations, they didn't ask for the miracle as a sign so that they can believe. But it was a, 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 a means to prove the falsehood of uh, the one who came and he claimed that he was the messenger of Allah. This is what happened with Thamud. It would happen with other nations. And so likewise, the tribe of Quraysh, they, in an attempt to, <coughs> uh, in an attempt to prove the falsehood of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they came and they said, we want a miracle. And uh, we're going to mention because there, there was an ayah that was sent to them, and they were going to talk about that in just a second. And the, and the reason why I'm saying that their, their request for a, an ayah or request for a, for a miracle was not so that they can see the miracle and believe, but rather was to prove uh, the falsehood of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The reason why we say that is because there was a miracle that they did see a sign and they didn't believe. Naam. So, uh, Al Imam Ahmed, rahimahullah, <coughs> he brings in his Musnad uh, with an authentic chain of narration. Uh, it was authenticated by a Sheikh Shu'aib Al Arnaud. It was also authenticated by a Sheikh Mustafa uh, Al Adawi. Uh, so, Al Imam Ahmed, rahimahullah, he brings his chain of narration on the authority of Abdullah ibn Abbas. Radiallahu anhuma, who said that Quraysh said to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Udru lana Rabbak an yaj'ala lana as-safa dhahaba. They Quraysh they said to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, call upon your Lord that he makes the mountain of Safa, he turns it into gold. Tell, call on your Lord. And tell him to make Safa, the mountain of Safa, turn it into gold. Uh, 
You do that, we'll believe in you. You do that, we'll believe in you. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he responded, he said, وَتَفْعَلُوا Like, you'll, you'll do that? Meaning if, if something that is as simple, because Allah has the ability to do all things. So uh, there's something as simple as Allah turning a safa into gold. That's all you need to believe? Meaning if Allah does that, you're going to believe? Uh, they said yes. They said yes. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he made dua. He asked Allah to turn a safa into gold. And then in Jibreel Alayhi Salam, he came to the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he said, <coughs> Indeed, Inna Rabbaka Yaqra'u Alayka Salam. Indeed, your Lord sends you Salam. And he says to you, If you like, I will turn a Safa into gold. He said, If you like, I'll turn a Safa into gold. فَمَنْ كَفَرَ بَعْدَ ذَلِكَ مِنْهُمْ عَذَّبْتُهُ عَذَابًا لَا أُعَذِّبُهُ أَحَدًا مِنَ الْعَالَمِينَ He said, and whoever disbelieves after that, I will punish him with a punishment that I have not punished anyone from the people of the world. And if you'd like, then I will open up the door of uh, repentance and mercy. And so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, Bel, Bab, At-Tawbah, Wa-Rahmah. He said, rather I'd like you to open the door of repentance and mercy. Uh, so this hadith, uh, in this hadith we see the diligence of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for his people to believe. Because now... <coughs> There is uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he knows the, the sunan or the ways of the previous nations. Allah Ta'ala in the Qur'an or throughout the Qur'an tells us about the, the ways and the methods of the previous nations and what they did. Uh, especially Thamud, they requested for the she-camel to come walking out of a boulder and they said if you do that then we'll believe and it, and it, and it happened the she came, it came out they saw it they witnessed it but yet they still didn't believe and so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam knowing this and understanding this uh, wanting not wanting for his people to be just annihilated <coughs> destroyed like the people of Ad or the people of Thamud uh, and, and others from the previous nations, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when given the choice, either we'll, we'll turn a Safa into gold, I'll turn Safa into gold, but whoever doesn't believe after that, they're going to get seriously punished. Or we can open the door of forgiveness, uh, repentance, and mercy. And you're not going to uh, turn Safa into gold and we will delay uh, any punishment and give the people an opportunity to accept Islam and to repent <coughs> and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he chose uh, the bab of, of a tawbah or the door of repentance and mercy uh, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala uh, he says in Surah Al-Isra, Surah number, who knows what Surah number is Isra? 17, Surah number 17. Allah says, وَمَا مَنَعَنَا أَن نُرْسِلَ بِالْآيَاتِ إِلَّا أَن Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and nothing has prevented us from sending the ayat except that the previous nations denied them. We gave Thamud, the she-camel, uh, as a visible sign, but they disbelieved in it, and we do not send the signs except as a warning. <clears throat> and so 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says here in, these, in this ayah that nothing prevented us from sending signs except that the previous nations rejected those signs, they denied those signs. <coughs> because Allah doesn't just send signs just for, the, just for the sake of it. You know, let me just send a few signs. Uh, now, those signs mean something. Those that, that they're evid it's evidence. And now that you've seen it, now the burden of proof is now established upon you. You witnessed it with your own eyes. And so uh, th these signs shouldn't be taken lightly. Like Allah Ta'ala mentioned, that we gave Thamud the she camel as a visible sign, but they rejected it, they denied it, they disbelieved in it. <coughs> we do not send the signs except as a warning. And so a person really needs to be careful. A person really needs to be careful when they see, when Allah sends visible signs. A person witnesses these visible signs, but yet continues to disbelieve. Allah says, وَمَا نُرْسِلُ بِالْآيَاتِ إِلَّا تَخْوِيفًا We do not send these signs except as warnings. We do not send these signs except as a warning. Uh, like for example, the other night, uh, maybe what, I don't know, two weeks ago, a month ago, uh, we witnessed uh, the moon eclipse. Right, we stood right here in the masjid and we watched the moon eclipse and we made the salah, and then after, even after the salah, we looked outside, and we could see, like, it was like a bloody moon, like, it was like red. Like, that's not, that's not normal. For a person, I mean, the moon isn't normally red like this. The moon doesn't normally eclipse like this. And so, a person who sees this, and then just goes about his business, disbelieving in Allah, he goes about his business, uh, disobeying Allah like how do you witness the might and the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala how do you see these signs but yet still disbelieve in Allah how do you witness Allah's ability but yet still disobey him uh, Allah ta'ala he, he tells us uh, in many places in the Quran, كَمَثَلِ غَيْثٍ أَعْجَبَ الْكُفَّارَ نَبَاتُهُ ثُمَّ يَهِيجُ فَتَرَاهُ مُصْفَرَّ ثُمَّ يَكُونُ حُطَامًا Allah Ta'ala talking, talking about the dunya, He says like the, 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 the rain that is pleasing to the, the farmers, they plant, uh, they plant their, uh, their crops and the seeds, the plants, the flowers, uh, the rain comes, and what happens, right? It produces greenery, colorful, it produces fruits, grass, trees, all of that. And, and the people who plant it are happy now, right? You're happy. I know that for myself, uh, when, I, when I put down the, the, the food for the grass, like right before the rain comes, it's like, yes, alhamdulillah. I, you know, and the rain comes, and then it, the grass, it grows vibrantly, it makes me happy, right? So people who are planting, and the rain comes, it makes them happy, and, they, and it comes out, the fruit comes out, the vegetables come out, all of that comes out. But, Allah Ta'ala, He says, uh, that then it dries, it dries up, it turns yellow, and then after it turns yellow, and brown, it dries, and it, 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 it becomes brittle. And what happens when it comes brittle? It, the wind comes by and blows it a little bit, and because it's so dry and brittle, that it starts to crumble into pieces to the point where it turns into like dust. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that this is the dunya. And we witness this with our own eyes. And then even the even scarier part after that, is that after it's turned into the leaves fall from the trees, they turn, they get hard, they fall down, 
For example, a, an animal or me or you will step on the leaf, it breaks, it crumbles, turns into dust. What happens a few months later? All the leaves are back again. As if they never went anywhere. Like our people see this. We see this, you know, year after year after year, season after season after season, we witness this with our own eyes. Allah sends us these signs. How does a person disbelieve and reject and say, oh, Allah doesn't have the ability to bring us back after we've died? Right? Uh, Allah Ta'ala says about the kuffar, وَكَانُوا يَقُولُونَ أَإِذَا مِتْنَا وَكُنَّا تُرَابًا وَعِظَامًا أَإِنَّا لَمَبْعُثُونَ أَوَأَبَاؤُنَا الْأَوَّلُونَ He said, and they used to say, when we die, and we turn into dirt, into bones, are we going to be resurrected? Us, our fathers as well, I mean our, our previous forefathers, right? Allah says, قُلْ إِنَّ الْأَوَّلِينَ وَالْآخِرِينَ لَمَجْمُعُونَ إِلَى مِقَاتِ يَوْمٍ مَعْلُومٍ Say to them, indeed the, the first and the last of the people are going to be gathered on a specified day. Going to be gathered on a specified day. How do we see and witness the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, His power to create, His power to resurrect? We see this. We, we witness it. Allah brings back to life things like, for example, uh, a starfish, right, a starfish. What happens when you cut off one of the, right, it grows back. It grows back like it never was gone, right? Those snakes, their skin, right, it sheds. Like they, they, they I don't know how they do it. I'm not an animal expert, but I know that they crawl out. Of, of dead skin and they have new skin. They have dead skin, they crawl out and there's new skin. Like we're, these are things that we see all the time. If you turn on, like I, when I was a child, I used to watch uh, nature shows on National Geographic, all these documentaries about birds and lions and you know, the Serengeti and all of these uh, places, the oceans and I used to watch and, and it's amazing when you go to the zoo, you go to the, to the aquarium and you see the, 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 the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, these are signs. How can a person see these things and then turn around and say there's no creator? How does a person witness the might of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then turn around and disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? As though Allah does not have the ability to seize an individual with punishment. And so we have to be very careful witnessing uh, the signs that have been sent by Allah. Because Allah says, وَمَا نُرْسِلُ بِالْآيَاتِ إِلَّا تَخْوِيفَ And we do not send the signs except as warnings. These signs, Allah Ta'ala sends them as warnings for us. Uh, warnings that there's a day that will we're going to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we're going to have to be or we're going to be held accountable for the things that we said and we've done uh, in this dunya. Uh, and, and one of the, one of the uh, amazing things, Allah ta'ala when he mentioned uh, in the Quran the sign that he actually did send because the tribe of Quraysh uh, even after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam chose a tawbah and rahmah they kept pushing for a sign, pushing for a sign. Send us a sign, send us a sign. <coughs> uh, and so Allah Ta'ala split the moon. Allah Ta'ala split the moon. And we're going to read some of the narrations connected to that in just a moment, inshallah. However, when Allah mentioned this in the Quran, when Allah mentioned this sign in the Quran, He also he mentioned along with it the coming of the, or the closeness of, of the establishment of the hour. Allah says, اِقْتَرَبَتِ السَّاعَةُ وَانْشَقَّ الْقَمَرُ That the hour is close and the moon is split. And so Allah combined these two issues together in the same ayah. The, the closeness of the hour 
and the sign that you requested. Yes. Yes. So the splitting of the moon, Allah says, اقتربت الساعة وانشق القمر the, the, the hour is close and the moon is split. <coughs> uh, now. Mm -hmm. So I actually thought about this, and I actually I was I was pondering over this, um, and the the only thing that I, I I actually searched in the books and in tafsir, uh, I didn't find anyone to who answered that question. However, uh, <coughs> the only thing that I can think of, the only thing that I can think of, and Allah Taala knows best is that they didn't request for the moon to be split. They requested a sign, but they didn't request for the moon to be split. So let, let's, we, if we take a step backwards and we look at all the people that Allah Ta'ala said, if I do this, then I'm, whoever disbelieves after that, then I'll punish them with the punishment that I'll never punish anyone uh, uh, ever so we have for example Thamud right we have Thamud they requested the she camel to come out of the boulder like they asked for that specifically and Allah Ta'ala gave it to them right they asked for that uh, specifically and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave uh, gave them that specifically uh, the Ma'idah the uh, people asked Isa alayhi salam for the ma'idah, for the food. Ask Allah to send down the ma'idah. All of us, that would be a way for all of us to eat. And Isa alayhi salam, he made that dua. And Allah said, if you look at the end of Surah Al-Ma'idah, uh, ayah number 115, Allah mentions that if, if I do this, whoever doesn't believe, who witnesses this and doesn't believe after this, then I'll punish him with the punishment uh, that I've never punished anyone else before. <coughs> so, uh, when we look at when Quraysh, what they asked for was for a Safa to be turned into gold. And that's when Allah said that if I do that, if I turn it into gold as they requested, then I'll punish them with this punishment. So, and then when I looked at all the narrations in, in connection with the splitting of the moon, you don't see anything authentic where Quraysh asked for the moon to be split. They just asked for an ayah. Send us a sign, send us a sign. So as I mentioned, I don't, I, I, I don't, I don't know any of the scholars, I'm saying I don't know any of the scholars who mentioned uh, this. However, from my humble readings and, and gathering, uh, this, is, this is what I noticed. Uh, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. So in answering that question, I would have to say that the difference is, or as to why, uh, even though there is an ayat sent, why didn't Allah destroy Quraysh uh, right there on the spot? Because they didn't ask for the moon to be split. Whereas they asked for Safa to, uh, to be turned into gold, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Uh, so Imam al-Bukhari, rahimahullah, <coughs> he brings uh, a chapter in the Sahih. Uh, it's called Bab in Shiqaq al-Qamr, the chapter of the splitting of the moon. Now, mind you, there are some kuffar and some of the Muslims who have followed me in the footsteps of the kuffar who have denied the occurrence of the split. They denied that the moon uh, has been split. They don't, they say no. <clears throat> and they bring a long laundry list of uh, reasons as to why. It's sufficient for us that uh, Allah mentions it in the Quran. It's sufficient for us that has been mentioned in the Sunnah of Allah's Messenger. There are scholars who, uh, past and present, who have uh, debated and, and dealt with the shubuhat 
of those who rejected uh, the splitting of the moon. Um, but for me, uh, it's sufficient to say that Allah said, and say that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, uh, <coughs> if anybody wants to go deep and to get into the philosophical arguments and debating, then they can go see someone else. Uh, I'm not the person for that. Um, so here under this chapter, Al-Imam Al-Bukhari, Rahimahullah, he brings uh, maybe four, uh, four narrations. The first narration uh, is, he said, on the authority of Anas ibn Malik, radiallahu anhu, who said that the people of Mecca asked Allah's Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to show them a miracle. So he showed them the moon split in two halves till they saw Hira, the Hira mountain in between them. So they saw, so uh, Anas said that the people of Quraysh, they saw the Hira mountain in between the two halves. So that no one comes and says, well, maybe it's, you know, maybe they were looking at it at an angle and, or maybe their vision was a little blurry. Uh, you know, maybe they, sometimes when people's bl uh, vision is blurry, you know, you see, you see two things. Like sometimes, like if I, if I wipe my eyes too hard, like I'll see two, I'll see two Abdul Hadis, right? And <clears throat> so, so that no one can misunderstand, Anas said that the, the, the mountain of Hira was in between the two pieces, was in between the two pieces. The next narration, <coughs> excuse me, the next narration, uh, Al-Bukhari, rahimahullah, he says on the authority of Abdullah, when, when Al-Bukhari says, Abdullah said, now there's multiple companions who were named Abdullah, right? Who was he referring to when he says Abdullah said or Abdullah did? Ibn Mas'ud. He's referring to Abdullah Ibn Mas'ud. If he's referring to uh, any of the other Sahaba, if he's referring to Ibn Umar, he refers to him as in, they refer to him as Ibn Umar or Abdullah Ibn Umar, or they refer to Abdullah uh, uh, Abdullah. Uh, uh, Abdullah ibn, uh, ibn Amr ibn al-As or they refer to Abdullah ibn al-Zubayr they'll, they'll mention him but when they say Abdullah they're referring to Abdullah ibn Mas'ud uh, for the most part uh, you can take that as a general principle if there's anything that uh, goes against that principle then it's, it's going to be rare it's going to be rare now <clears throat> Al-Muhim uh, here he says Abdullah reported that the moon was split into two pieces while we were with the Prophet ﷺ in Mina. He said, Ishhadu, be a witness. Then a piece of the moon went towards the mountain. And so Abdullah bin Mas'ud, <coughs> who was actually present uh, when the incident took place, who he also, he saw uh, this with his own two eyes. Uh, they were in Mina. And the Prophet ﷺ told them, Ishhadu, bear witness to what you see. Uh, the next narration uh, is reported, he's Al-Bukhari, he brings, he says, on the authority of Abdullah ibn Abbas. You see, before, in the last narration he said, it's reported by Abdullah. Now he says, it was reported by Abdullah ibn Abbas. Uh, <clears throat> so he says, during the lifetime of Allah's Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the moon was split. Uh, in the last narration he brings uh, on the authority of Abdullah, radiallahu anhu, he says, the moon split into two uh, pieces. And so, <coughs> uh, these, are, these are all narrations that show that this took place during the lifetime of the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Rather, it took place during the Meccan period. It took place during the Meccan period. <coughs> and uh, as we mentioned, Allah Ta'ala, He revealed verses uh, in reference to this incident. Uh, the first, uh, the beginning ayat of Surah Al-Qamar. Surah Al-Qamar is what surah? What's the number? 54. MashaAllah, Abu Tariq is on point. 
I'm, we're going to stop letting Abu Talib answer all the questions about the Quran. And so you can let other people get a chance, inshallah. Uh, so yes, in the, ver uh, the opening verses of Surah Al-Qamar, Allah says, اِقْتَرَبَتِ السَّاعَةُ وَانْشَقَّ الْقَمَرُ وَإِنْ يَرَوْ آيَةً يُعْرِضُوا وَيَقُولُوا سِحْرٌ مُسْتَمِرٌ Allah says that the hour is close and the moon is split. And if they see a sign, they turn away and they say, this is magic. Uh, in reference to this, um, uh, this ayat, these ayats were revealed <coughs> about the splitting of the moon. And the evidence for that is, uh, there's a narration in a Tirmidhi and also, I brought this is the uh, Mu'jam al-Kabir by Al-Imam al-Tabarani. And the reason why I brought this book and not the Sunan al-Tirmidhi is because there's a fa'id al there's a linguistic uh, benefit that I wanted to mention uh, in just a second, inshallah. Uh, and so Al-Imam al-Tabarani, rahimahullah, he brings in the Mu'jam al-Kabir. <coughs> uh, this narration was authenticated by a Sheikh Muqbil, uh, rahimahullah ta'ala. Uh, it's on the authority of Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhumah uh, he said that the, the moon uh, had uh, the, the moon had eclipsed uh, during the Ahd of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and what he meant by that is the, the splitting of the moon and they said suhira al qamar that the moon was magic was placed uh, on the moon fanazalat iqtarabat as-sa'atu wa anshaqa al qamar ila qawlihi mustamir so allah revealed the ayat uh, the moon or the hour is close and the moon is split all the way to allah's statement they will say uh, that this is magic so here uh, the reason why I wanted to bring this narration is because there was a discussion uh, in the masjid uh, a while back about the wording uh, uh, khusuf and kusuf. Kusuf with a kaf and khusuf with a kha. And there were people who were saying that uh, kusuf with a kaf is specific for the sun and the khusuf uh, with a kha is specific for the moon and I had said back at that point that no it's permissible to use the calf for both the sun and the moon it's permissible to use the calf for both the sun and the moon and uh, here in this narration Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhuma he used uh, the calf uh, for the moon and that was the uh, what I wanted to show uh, if you don't necessarily understand then don't worry inshallah uh, it will come up later uh, one of the things that I wanted to mention in reference to the incident of the splitting of the moon is the fact that Allah he does with his creation that which he pleases uh, and, and, and more specific the moon itself because the moon um People claim that the moon is scientific, meaning it, it moves at precise, calculated movements, that where it never strays away from that calculated uh, movement. And <clears throat> that's why they say we should use calculations in establishing the beginning of Ramadan or the end of Ramadan. We say this right here, this incident is one of the evidences that disproves uh, this type of thinking. See why? Because in this case, the moon did something that was not, it wasn't, you weren't, you weren't, you would not have been able to calculate that. You would not have been able to calculate the splitting of the moon. So that when the moon split, it actually became two pieces. Now, was that 
part of the calculation, uh, if someone was to, were to calculate the movement of the moon for that night, would they, have, would they have been able to account in their calculations for the split? And you know, were they going to, the calculation, was it going to be for the right side? Was it going to be for the left side? So uh, what happened there? What happened was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala caused the moon to split. Allah does with the moon, He commands the moon and the moon obeys. Allah commands the moon and the moon obeys. Whether that is in agreement with someone's calculations or it's in disagreement with someone's calculations, that's irrelevant. So for someone to come and say that the calculations say that the moon can be seen or the moon cannot be seen, we say, well, what may you drink? Who are you to say that Allah doesn't cause the moon to be seen on a day that the calculations say that it's not supposed to be seen just as an ikhtibar, as a test to see if you're going to obey his messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam or are you going to disobey the messenger? You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he mentioned about the, 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 the qibla. Allah mentioned about the qibla that the Qibla, he made the Qibla as a test to see who's going to follow the messenger and who's going to turn on, uh, who's going to turn or, uh, uh, and turn around and, and, and turn their backs and, and run away. Allah made that as a test. At first the people were praying to Bayt al-Maqdis, right? When they were in Mecca, they're praying towards Bayt al-Maqdis. And then when they got to Medina, Allah ordered them, first they're praying north, right? At one time, they're praying north. The direction is north. Because Syria, I mean, uh, uh, Jerusalem is uh, generally, the direction is north of, of Medina, in general. But then they get to Medina, so now which direction they were commanded to pray in? South. Now you're commanded to pray south. Are you going to obey Allah or are you going to disobey? You know, one day Allah says, pray north. The next day Allah says, pray south. Are you going to argue with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Or are you going to obey? Right? So, and we have this even down. For example, in Ramadan, the last day of Ramadan is haram to eat. Right? It's haram to eat and drink during the day. The very next day, that very next day, it's wajib to eat and drink during the day. So one day is haram to eat and drink during the day. The next day is wajib to eat and drink during the day. All of that is, just, are we going to obey or are we going to disobey? And so, uh, the issue of the moon, uh, and, and the reason why I brought this up is this, this incident is regarding the moon and the splitting of the moon. Allah Ta'ala, He does with the moon as He pleases. Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala does with the moon as He pleases. Our job is to obey Allah. Our job is to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everything else, that's, you know, we, we can deal with it on the day of judgment. You say, what if we make a mistake? What if you make a mistake? Science and math is absolute. One plus one equals two. The square root of two is four. A squared plus B squared equals C squared. You see how easy that is? Right? So math doesn't make mistakes. People make mistakes. So what are you going to do on the day of judgment when you've come and you've made a mistake? Especially a mistake in fasting in Ramadan. So okay, good question. What I'm going to say is, Oh Allah, you commanded me, and I said I hear and I obey. What are you going to do when Allah asks you, why did you use calculations? Show me an ayah or show me a hadith where Allah or His Messenger وسلم, ordered us to use calculations. So when Allah asks you, when Allah asks me that I've made a mistake, I fasted on the wrong day because someone said they saw the moon, but they really didn't see the moon. There was a mistake. What I'm going to say is that, O oh Allah, your Prophet and Messenger Muhammad said, Sumuli ru'yatihi 
Fast when you see it, break your fast when you see it. That's what I'm going to say. But when Allah asks you, when Allah asks you, why didn't you fast when the Muslims informed you that they saw the moon? And you say, oh Allah, uh, the calculation said that you know, it wasn't supposed to be seen. Where is, you know, Allah, Allah will ask you after that, what, what, what command were you following? Whose order were you following when you made this decision? Whose sunnah were you following? And so these are things that we really have to, we really have to take into, into, uh, into consideration. Um, the issue of science, sometimes science, even if science affirms certain things, religiously, Islamically, we don't confirm simply because science says so. I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, a zina or adultery you want to accuse someone of committing adultery how many witnesses do you need huh two more, two more? Two males. Four. how many how many witnesses you need all together how many you need four. you need four you need four okay what if right what if uh, I come in to the judge I say judge so and so committed zina he said, where are your witnesses? He says, look, I have my proof here on this, uh, on this uh, drive. Look at the video. Is that sufficient? No. La. For the judge it is. No, it's not. No, it's not. It's, it's not. Huh? Which judge? Talking about the Muslim judge. Yeah, the Muslim judge. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not, uh, yeah, so th this, you have to have four witnesses and that does not, that video does not replace the four witnesses. Okay, person argues with that. Tayyip, uh, the hadith of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, al-waladu lil-farash, the baby belongs to the bed. So let's say a man, is married to a lady, right? The man is married to the lady and she has a baby, that's his wife. He claims, that's my son. The husband says, that's my son. Another man says, no, that's my son. I, you know, we did what we did and that's my son. The husband says, that's my wife, so that's my son. So now the two men are in dispute. Who's the father? The, the, the child looks like the other man. They do a DNA test. They do a DNA test. And it comes out that the child is the other man's. But who does the son belong to? Hukman. The husband. That's the husband's son. The husband says, that's my son. That because why? Because he was born on my bed. And we're going to, we're going to make ilhaq. We're going to say that that's that man's son. Because the Prophet wasallam said, al-waladu lil-farash. That the baby belongs to the bed. So science may confirm one thing, but the ruling of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is something different. We follow what Allah has ruled in the issue. And science can never overrule what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed. You may say, well, that, why does that make, that doesn't make any sense. Or why does this, or why does that? Listen, our question is not to ask why. Our question is to say we hear and we obey. That, that's it. Why? Allahu alam. Because there might be some wisdom in this that you, you can't understand. Even if it was explained to you, you may, it may go over your head. There's a lot of issues, a lot of issues. I remember uh, I learned about the issue of praying at home uh, when it rains, even if it's light rain. Uh, I learned that a long time ago. 
back here in America. Didn't I, I personally? Uh, I said, you know, we have cars, and uh, you know, why? Why would it's just drizzling? Why would we have to pray home? But this is the Sunnah, so you know, we accept it. But it wasn't until I got to Medina, when I got to my to Medina, and I experienced my first rain. It rained for maybe ten minutes, and the streets flooded. The streets absolutely flooded. I, I, I was amazed at how much water was running through the streets after 10 minutes of rain. And that's when I, it dawned on me. I said, this, this is why. Now, this makes, this makes sense. Now I understand. Now I understand. Now, because America has drains and, you know, different things. And, and even in, in, in certain places in the United States, it isn't all drains and it floods in some places my backyard has it floods sometimes if it rains too long and so you can't think of things just in in our like personal space and understand things like Allah sent Islam as a religion for the world so this the, what Allah revealed it's applicable uh, in South Africa it's applicable in Timbuktu it's applicable in Alaska in, in Venezuela, all over the world, this, this Allah revealed this. So we can't just look at it from a standpoint of Kissimmee, Florida, or the standpoint of what's happening in 2022. Right? We have to think, because there, there are things that haven't even happened yet. There's life and culture that hasn't, hasn't occurred yet. What happens when, let's say, Allah Ta'ala allows the world to live until, let's say, 2050? Right? What the, what's the world going to be like in 2050? There's certain ahkam that the absolute wisdom of some of that may not even be realized and recognized until 2050, 2060, 2070. And so our job is not to, some people they only obey once they understand and agree. This is something that's very important. There are some people who only obey when they understand and agree. When they understand and agree, they say, okay, I'm going to obey. If they don't understand or if they don't agree, then they don't obey. I say to those individuals, you're not being obedient. You're following your desires. That's not called obedience. Only time that you comply is when you understand and when you agree. And if you don't understand or you don't agree, you don't comply, that's ittiba al hawa. That's what a person is following his desires. Because he's following what, what is in agreement with, you know, with what, what he thinks. Uh, obedience is to say, I hear and I obey because Allah said it. Because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said it. And that's, that's obedience. As it relates to, I'm not going to wear hijab until I understand why, why, why do women have to wear hijab and men don't have to wear uh, hijab. And by the way, men do have to wear hijab. Is that their hijab is a little different. Uh, than, so why, or let me use different terminologies. A, person, a woman says, well, I'm not going to wear khimar until I understand why uh, women have to wear khimar and men don't have to wear khimar. And then, once I understand, I have to agree with that before I do it. Say, la, al hawa. This is, you're, you're just following desires uh, when you, you comply with what agrees with you and you don't comply with what doesn't agree with you. This is ittiba uh, al hawa. This is a person following his desires. This is not the person being uh, obedient. Uh, and we have to be obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and what Allah has commanded. Whether we understand the wisdom or we don't understand the wisdom, if we understand that Allah has commanded it, we say we hear and we obey. That should be sufficient for the believer. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Now, if we can call the adhan, uh, and we'll take any questions, inshallah.
Ashhadu an la لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله. حي على الصلاة. لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله. حي على الصلاة. لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله. وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله. حي على الصلاة. لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله. الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله لا إله إلا الله اللهم رب هذه الدعوة التامة وصلاة القائمة آتي محمد على المسير والفضيل وبعث المقام محمود على الوعد Uh, I mean, if anybody has any questions about the class, then they'll come first. Anybody have anything about the class specifically? So you're saying it's explicit no because they are saying that we should come to the masjid? No. no okay. Okay. I'm saying the sunnah is that any rain, whether it's light or heavy, gives us permission to pray at home, regardless as to whether or not we have raincoats or cars, or drains, or any of that. Because the drain, <clears throat> even with the drain, it doesn't stop you from getting wet. You know, a person having a drain in the city, like, like right now we have, we have drains and we have ditches or retention ponds. We have all kinds of stuff to prevent flooding. Uh, but if you walk outside in the rain and it's raining, you're going to get wet. And so the question becomes, uh, no one really knows exactly why. And, th and this is the problem of uh, Ahlul Ra'i or Istikhraj Al-Ilal or a person trying to put the reasoning why certain rulings were revealed. So a person tries to come and say, we're told to pray at home when it rains because of this, Right? And so since we have drains or since we have cars, right? So a person may say, well, Allah wanted us to have protected from the rain and so we don't get wet. But now that we have cars, <coughs> we're not going to get wet, so we should still come to the masjid. My question to you would be, what makes you know that this is the reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave this ruling? What's your delil? Or are you saying about Allah that which you don't know? And it's very dangerous, very, very dangerous because what happens is people, scholars, not talking about just people, scholars have in the past have come and they said the reason why Allah revealed this is because of this. Therefore, and then, so they don't stop there, they, they, they add on to it, the therefore, and they build upon that rulings they build upon that rulings. And like here, Allah, uh, he allowed us to pray at home in the rain so that we don't get wet. So since we have cars, we're not going to get wet. That means we still should come to the masjid, right? You say, well, how do you know? How do you know there wasn't something else, a different reason? How do you know that? What's your delil for this? And so, and, and, and I, I'm, not, I'm not the one who's saying uh, that since we have drains, that we don't come to the masjid, uh, that we do come to the masjid when it rains. We say that Allah knew, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He knew that there will be drains. He knew that there will be cars. <coughs> he knew that there will be raincoats and umbrellas. He knew about all of that. When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam 
told the people to pray in their homes because it was raining, Allah knew, even if the Prophet Wasallam didn't know, right? he may not have known, but Allah knew. And so therefore, if there was going to be some ruling connected to this, uh, this some type of exception, some type of situation, then Allah would have ordered the Prophet Wasallam to explain that. And so since he, it wasn't explained, it was left it was left open, left general, then no matter what the situation is, if it rains, if it's raining, say, what kind of rain? Is it raining? Just answer the question, is it raining? Yes, then we pray at home. Is it raining? No, we come to the masjid. Say, what if it's heavy rain? What if it's light rain? And people have gone through these definitions. If the rain drops or X amount of size, and la, if, if it rains and it's heavy enough, to, and you, your, your bottom is getting wet or the top of you is getting wet, la, 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 la. Is it raining or is it not raining? If it's raining, it's, we're, we're given the, con the concession to pray at home. If it's not raining, then we come to the masjid. Simple. What do you mean? Okay, you said Allah knows that we're going to have rain, and uh -huh. still the ruling applies. It rains, we stay home. Yes. Allah knows that we're going to have cars. And yeah. It's going to take us 15 minutes to do 10 miles. Whereas if we didn't have cars, we had to walk or go by camel, it's going to take us half a day. Mm -hmm. That would be like a travel. So, first of all, uh, traveling, uh, Mutara, you want to you wanna bring this up again? My, my, the, my position on traveling has absolutely nothing to do with cars or planes. It, whatever, I'm, I'm saying traveling. So the rule, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses terminologies in the Quran and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uses terminologies in the sunnah. Okay? That term, that whatever term is used. So let's... let's Let's take a step backwards from traveling for, for a minute. Let's talk about being good to your parents. Right? Allah says, وَوَصَّيْنَا الْإِنسَانَ بِوَالِدَيْهِ إِحْسَانًا And we have admonished or we have ordered the, pers the people to be good to his parents. Okay. What does that mean? Specifically. No, no. Specifically. Like what... Like when I go now to implement that with my mother and my father, what does that mean? Like what, how do I, what are the steps that I need to take in order to treat my parents good? What determines good treatment and in an and, and, and act of me being obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How many times a week do I need to call my mother on the phone or how many times a week do I need to visit her in order for me to be obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Now, if you, if you were to ask my mother in, in specific, right, my mother doesn't necessarily like it when I'm calling her, calling her, calling her. Right? She, she, she won't, after, if, after a while, she might get annoyed with me I say, what, 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 I just talked to you yesterday. What, 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 is everything okay? Is it an emergency? What's wrong? Right? That, that's just my mother. But I know other mothers. No, no. They, you need to, you, you, you talk to her for an hour after Fajr. You need to talk to her an hour after Asr. Because that's, that's the, and so what determines, my point of all this, what determines this is the understanding of the culture that you come from. Right? Your mother and your father, do they feel like you're being good? Do they feel like you are fulfilling this commandment? Right? Are you doing what culturally is normally understood that a child is supposed to be doing for their, for their parents? Like when I was in Saudi Arabia, uh, the, uh, there was a, we had a teacher who uh, he said, uh, he was talking about his being, you know, being good to the parents. And he said within his tribe, right, in his tribe, whatever, I forget what tribe he was from, his father had an issue, uh, was sitting on the toilet. Whatever toilet they had, they had, his father had an issue. And so he used to put his arms on the toilet seat. And his father would sit 
instead of sitting directly on the, the, the seat itself, he was, his son, this is the sheikh himself, he's telling us this. He put, his, he put his arms over the seat and his father would sit on his arms and use the bathroom. Uh, <laughs> Alhamdulillah, I don't come from a culture that that's required of me. Uh, my father would, uh, if I put my arms on the toilet seat, I'd say, you go, go, go ahead, sit down, sit down, Baba. Hey, boy, what, get out of here, what are you doing? I need to use the bathroom, get out of here. He, you know, he'd be angry. But I, I, honestly, I don't know, I'm just saying that this, this is, I'm telling this is what he was saying, and my point is that, you know, in, in his culture, this is what was considered to be, you know, ikram and, and being good to his father, helping his father. I'm saying that, so the terminology, the terminology that Allah uses here, and be good to your parents, what defines that is the culture that you come from and what's understood amongst the people as this is what it means to be good to one's parents. So now that we understand that, let's go back to, go back to traveling. So, unless there is an actual definition of traveling that has been given to us by Allah or given to us by the Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then we're going to define traveling as what's understood by us when we hear the word traveling. If you say to me, traveling is driving up the street. Wa alaykum salam wa rahmatullah. And I ask you, billahi alayk, I ask you, by Allah, you believe that's traveling? You say, wallahi, this is what I understand traveling to be. I want to say, well then, who am I to, you know, you're going to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But again, I think we've talked about this uh, before. If you deem that to be traveling, then all of the rules of traveling have to apply. Which includes your wife, your daughters, your aunties, your sisters cannot travel alone without a mahram. So a person can't say, well, I believe, you know, going around the corner is traveling, right? So I'm going to pray two rakah, two rakah. I'm going to break my fast. But then he sends his wife to the store by herself, right? And says, you know, my wife needs to go to the store. You say, la, la, it can't, it can't, you can't have it both ways. Because if it's traveling, then all of the rules of traveling, they have to apply. They have to apply. So if a person, his methodology, he says, wallahi, I believe it's traveling. I don't allow my wife to go there except that she has a mahram. This, I, I apply all the rules of traveling that I'm not going to argue. I'm not going to argue with that person. Last thing, because the brothers are here to make salat, inshallah. And we do it. We say we hear and we obey. We we hear and we obey. And um, هذا والله تعالى أعلم وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد.